And I thought, well, uh, I hate to waste a good slide, so I think I will actually take you through some of these slides. But I think the, the focus now is going to be really about the, the bill and, and some of the context here that we'll just quickly go through. Um, so some questions that were setting out on Monday, partly on the basis of all the, the sort of prior press briefing before the, um, the bill actually arrived. Um, you know, small boats has been the focus of a lot of the um, public media sort of policy discourse. Um, and of course, there are people who are claiming asylum who arrive by other means as well. Um, so what proportion of asylum seekers are actually arriving by small boat? Um, how far have small boats contributed to the asylum backlog? Um, Shireen's already talked a little bit about that. She's got a better version of one of my slides, actually, so I can skip over that one fairly, <laughs> fairly briefly. Um, how many of the people who are arriving are actually refugees? Now, that matters to some people. It doesn't matter so much to other people, but I think it's, it, it's, it's certainly interesting anyway. Um, what is our current detention capacity? Because the government was briefing about this plan to, to detain everybody when they arrive, which is partly reflected in the bill, as we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. And then also, and I think this is relevant um, to, to, to the discussion, how good is the Home Office at removing failed asylum seekers? Um, so just quickly looking at arrivals, you can see we've kind of been here before. That, that spike in 2002, this is the number of people including dependents. So you see different versions of this chart. Sometimes it's the number of applications, sometimes it's the number of actual people because there can be several people on each application. So um, yeah, I was around in, in 2002, I'm sorry to say, and I can remember that it's not that back then everything was really calm and everybody was really relaxed about asylum. There were all sorts of media stories about asylum seekers eating swans and donkeys and all sorts of really weird stuff, frankly. And, and, and the, the press w went berserk, essentially. Um, but, as you can see, there was a policy response which led to numbers falling sharply. Numbers stayed then relatively low compared to at least to, to, to then and to today for quite a long period. And then um, small boat crossings started to, to creep up just before the pandemic from a, a base of zero. No, they just didn't happen in the past. Started in very small numbers in 2018 and they've increased considerably since. And initially, um, people were able to say, well, look, it's a change of route. Um, the actual numbers overall of people coming to claim asylum in the UK haven't gone up. What's happened is people are shifting route from arriving in lorries to arriving in small boats instead. But I don't think that's something that realistically you can say today if you look at those numbers. You know, the absolute numbers of people claiming asylum has sharply increased um, over the last year or so, and it, it's due to this new route of, of, of arriving in a small boat. So what proportion do arrive in small boats? It's about 15%, basically. I, I apologise to the data viz people. I don't know if anybody here has ever upset data viz Twitter, but it, you know, it's, it's brutal out there, brutal. You're not, you're not supposed to use pie charts, and even less these, whatever they're called, that look like pie charts, but we've got a hole in them, donut charts, that's what they're called. Um, but I think it's quite pretty, so I like, I like using it. But um, small boats, 15% um, of overall arrivals. And you can see that I've kind of cheated here a bit, because I've included other irregular arrivals. So for example, in the back of lorries as well, um, I've also included the Hong Kong scheme. Now, they would not, I think, characterise themselves as refugees. They wouldn't like to be labelled as refugees, but it's a protection-like scheme, um, and people are moving here, perhaps for multiple reasons, but the reason that that scheme was set up was to allow people to relocate because of political repression. There's also the Ukraine scheme, which has been massive. Um, now, I, haven't, I, I should have checked this this morning, but I, I haven't, I can't remember what the numbers are, um, today, but we're talking about 120, 130,000 Ukrainians have arrived since um, the scheme opened uh, in, in February. So it's been a huge number of people coming in on an uncapped visa scheme. So there's a sort of simple visa application process now. You'll remember the Home Office really struggled to implement this at the outset, but it's become quite a big success. Um, there's no cap on that route. And therefore, you do not see Ukrainians arriving in small boats because they do not need to. Um, they can stay in other European countries or they can apply for a visa to come to the UK. And then there's a, a really small section there for resettlement, which is the other resettlement scheme. So resettlement from Afghanistan, from Syria, from UNHCR camps and so on. But um, I say Afghanistan, you know, the, the, this, it's sort of held out as being uh, an example of the safe and legal routes that people can use to arrive in the UK to claim asylum. Actually, 22 Afghans arrived in the whole of last year under that resettlement route. So it's a tiny number were able to make use of it. 
it's true that a very substantial number arrived, 20, 22,000 I think it was, uh, immediately during and after the evacuation. But after that, the route essentially closed. And what we've also seen is a, a sharp increase in the number of Afghans who've been arriving by small boat. So the, the, there's certainly a, um, a, a correlation there anyway, um, or a link anyway. Um, so that's some of the context, and this is the less good version of Shireen's chart. You can see that essentially trying to make the point here that it's not the arrivals that has caused the backlog to, to soar. Um, it's really a slowdown in the number of, of decisions being made. Are the people who are arriving refugees? Overwhelmingly, yes, they are. Now, this chart doesn't tell you the whole picture. It, it tells you that 76% of, of decisions made by the Home Office, which admittedly wasn't as many as we'd like because you know, the backlog's been going up, there's not enough decisions being made, but 76% of them were a grant of asylum of some sort. And then, of the people who appeal, half of them get asylum as well. Um, so it's not even 76%, it's higher than that. Not everybody appeals, so you can't quite say that it's you know, an extra sort of 50% uh, of, of, of what's left. But overwhelmingly, the people who are arriving are refugees, and you can see that with the percentage of grants for some of the main countries who are, who, who are coming in. So 91% of Afghans, 97% of Eritreans, and so on. So if you come from one of those countries, essentially you're a refugee. And you can see the composition of the backlog here as well. Um, a lot of those countries, I'm not going to flip between the two too much, but a lot of those countries features here, and you know, a, a substantial number of those people waiting in the backlog will eventually be recognised as refugees. And why the, the, the government can't just get on with it um, so that people can get their status and move on with their lives um, is a bit of a mystery. So with that in mind, does the, uh, what, what the illegal migration bill, as it's called, I keep on wanting to call it the illegal immigration bill, and I think a lot of, pe lot of us are making that mistake, it's the illegal migration bill, is it likely to, to, to do anything to tackle the backlog, to reduce the numbers, and so on? And I think that the short answer is, is probably not, basically. So the idea is that it will prevent and deter illegal migration. And the problem that the government has got is that a bill, even if it's on goat hide, does not stop anybody from coming to the UK. You can't stretch it really thinly across the channel to, to prevent people from entering. It doesn't prevent anything from happening by itself. It's just a piece of paper. It could conceivably deter people from coming, but it depends on the decision-making of tens of thousands of individuals whose lives are a mystery even to dedicated researchers, people like me who've worked with, with refugees for a long time, never mind to the kind of people who are coming up with these plans in dark rooms in, in Westminster or whatever. Um, so is it going to um, achieve that kind of object of deterrence? I don't know, but I suspect not, because the, the two ways that it hopes to deter people is essentially by refusing them access to the asylum system. Now, I, I don't think that fully encapsulates quite how drastic this bill is. Essentially, it scraps the UK's asylum system. There will be no more asylum decisions at all being made, apart from for perhaps a tiny number of refugees who manage to enter lawfully and then apply for asylum once they're here without deceiving the authorities. That does happen occasionally, but it's very, very few people. So generally speaking, essentially this is closing down the UK asylum system. And the idea is that that will then um, uh, prevent people from getting any kind of status. So they will, the, the, the bill literally prohibits the government from, um, from, from granting status of any kind or citizenship or citizenship to their children, even, remarkably, um, in future. So it, it, it legally prevents that from happening. And the idea is that you will never get an, a decision on your asylum claim because it will never be considered. And also you'll be banned from getting status either if you stay in the country or if you leave and come back or, or anything like that. You, you can never get lawful status in the UK. And also it imposes a duty on the Secretary of State to remove you. Now, imposing a duty on somebody to do something is one thing. Them actually doing it is potentially quite different. And the problem that the government has is that you cannot remove people back to their home country if they're a genuine refugee. And um, you, know, you can't start sending Afghans back to Afghanistan. You can't start sending Eritreans back to Eritrea. And as cynical as I am about some things that this government does, I don't think the government is going to try and start doing that. And in fact, I know that they're not going to try and start doing that because they say they won't in this bill. This bill actually prevents them from removing you 
back to your home country. It says you cannot be removed back to your home country if you come from almost any country in the world that's not Europe, basically, or Albania. Um, which is remarkable. <laughs> so it says that you can't be removed back to your home country, but you can be removed to a safe third country. It's just that there is no safe third country to remove people to. Now, obviously, there's all the, the, the attention that we've seen attached to the Rwanda scheme, and the government seems to hope that at some point in future it will be able to send people to um, Rwanda. Uh, Suella Bravman has talked about her, her dreams of, of, of flights for Rwanda taking off and so on. But um, according to um, some, some briefing the Times had a couple of days ago, the earliest the government hopes that's going to happen is December um, 2023, perhaps March 2024, assuming that they win the legal challenge. So I'm, I'm going to sort of assume for a moment they do win the legal challenge and the government is going to be able to remove people to Rwanda. If this sort of twin track approach of saying we're going to remove you, perhaps, and you'll never get status here, if that deters people from coming, then there's no problem for the government because there won't be any people to remove. If it doesn't deter people from coming, if people continue to arrive in the sorts of numbers that we've seen previously, 89,000 applications over the last year, then the government is going to have literally tens of thousands of people, most of whom are refugees, to remove to safe third countries like Rwanda or if they reach a deal with some other country to, to those other countries as well. I don't know if you can imagine how hard that will be for the government to do, how brutal it will be how violent it will be. I think, you know, if we're talking about enforced removals, I think it's a mistake not to realise that that is coercion and that it's going to be violent, that people will struggle against it, and that people struggle against it even if they're being removed back to their home country, a country that they, they know very well, even after they've had their asylum claim decided and refused. The idea that people who are going to be removed to a completely different country on a different continent, you know, people coming from Afghanistan being removed to Rwanda and so on. Um, the idea that they will go quietly, peacefully, is just not true. You know, there will be resistance to removal. So tens of thousands of people will have to be removed um, according to this duty that the Secretary of State will have imposed on herself. And then also anybody who arrives after these flights start to take off. So you've got to get through the backlog and you've also got to get through all of the new arrivals until your policy of deterrence starts to work, if it ever works. So it's a huge logistical challenge, shall we say. I'm ignoring the morality of this. It's a huge logistical challenge that the government is setting itself. And it just doesn't really look very um, credible when it comes down to it. So um, there are, I, I, I could go through some of these sort of intricacies of the bill. I don't think it'd be a particularly useful thing to do. There is a kind of very narrow form of legal challenge to removal to one of these safe countries. If you say that um, you, you know, your human rights will be breached by being sent there, very difficult to run those kinds of challenges. Your grounds for challenging it will be quite weak in most cases. Um, but that, that's the kind of broad um, thrust of the bill. It's that kind of duty to remove um, plus remove you to a safe third country. So let me just carry on with the, the rest of the presentation that I, I abandoned quickly. So, quickly Colin, yeah, very, very quickly. So we're talking about the number of people um, who you have to detain, you know, 89,000 people a year. Detention capacity at the moment, it's about 600 asylum seekers in detention at any given moment. So you're going to have to build an extensive network of detention camps. This is the story of enforced returns. It's the dark blue. It has started to go up very slightly, but less than 500 failed asylum seekers were removed back to their home country um, in the last year. So enforced removals are not at high levels. The Home Office really struggles to conduct these enforced removals, and you can see even voluntary returns are very low as well. This is um, a slightly different story. I don't, I don't want to really talk about this. This is, this is Dublin. I was going to talk about this on my original plan. Um, you can see enforced removals um, transfers out from the UK on that red line falling over time. This is the other third country, safe third country agreement that the UK used to have but left behind with Brexit. And the Home Office line has always been, well, it never worked. Look, look at that, that chart falling down and look at the green line going up. Actually, more people were arriving under Dublin than were being removed. But if you look at other countries, 
you can see the UK is that blue line at the bottom. That's the transfers out from the UK. But you've got other countries, and I've picked a fairly random selection there of countries that aren't actually members of the EU and are in kind of northern Western Europe. Um, they were actually removing far more numbers than the UK was. So it's not that Dublin doesn't work, it's that the Home Office doesn't work, perhaps. Um, so policy responses so far, um, you know, we've got the, the bill now as well to add to this um, not terribly inspiring list. Um, but, you know, there, there are other possibilities. None of them are easy solutions, I think. None of them would stop the boats as such, but they would at least be more plausible policy responses um, and uh, slightly more likely to achieve something than simply building up a massive backlog of tens of thousands of people who you've actually literally legally legislated to prevent yourself from ever granting status. Okay. Thank you very much.